why does it have to be that way? Why do like what what's the reasoning? Just because that's the way it is now? How do you don't, you don't own ownership in a company? Others? What do you mean? Who owns the company? I mean, I everyone guess everyone owns it. Everyone who works there owns it. Well, then they Boom. all have to cough up the capital to do it. Boom. I mean, then they can there go does. make their own company. <laughs> like, what do you mean? If you want to do that, if you want to get 20 workers together and they all have 10 grand that they want to throw into a company, well then they they're welcome to go and do it. The thing is that they don't have 10 grand because most conversations typically start with um, any sort of surplus value that you're scraping from a laborer is exploitative in a highly immoral fashion. And that's usually like where the conversation starts. So it's like, well, now I just want to analyze like because usually this is my line usually I say oh well economic systems are descriptive these don't really like you know this person makes two dollars an hour like that's not in and of itself inherently evil like that's just an economic analysis when I remember that when you told me that though there's no evidence of communists of stable communist country in the world and you know why because of capitalism capitalist country in the world fuck all us up I mean, it's even if that was true, that's not my fault that your economic system is too weak to resist outside pressure. If anything, that's another argument oh for capitalism. I, well, I'm Dude, sorry, like, if your countries have... roll over because they can't defend themselves, that sounds like a good argument for my system. Oh, I'm well, sorry, but... So I've been trying to figure out what's so irksome to me about Destiny and his debates with all these leftists. And I think it's the fact that he sees capitalism as just the way things are, right? Purely this descriptive, morally neutral system for simply allocating resources where workers are free to get a job wherever they want for a wage and you know, if their job sucks ass, they're free to get another one. And where any excesses it exhibits can simply be reformed or regulated away by the state. This not only ignores a long history of class struggle in which workers fight ferociously for concessions only to have them revoked later on, but it shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the mechanisms of capital, which I'll talk about shortly. But first, I want to clear up the myth that capitalism was just this natural, peaceful progression away from feudalism, in which some people just worked harder than others and diligently built up their wealth, naturally leaving the lazy workers to accept wages for work. In fact, the proletarianization and depeasantization that took place in Europe was extremely brutal and violent. The enclosure movements, which kicked people off their land and forced them into cities to work for a wage, the enslavement of Africans and the slaughter of Native Americans in the name of colonial conquest and riches, and the systematic subjugation of women to the reproduction of the workforces and the killing of the witches, are not only stains on the fabric of this planet, but necessary and vital components in the creation of capitalism. All that to say that this was anything but a natural process. And today, as much as liberals love to believe that capitalism and liberalism are the paragons of freedom, democracy, and equality, well, I beg to differ. What's ultimately really frustrating is to watch someone like Destiny, a fairly smart guy with a ton of followers and a lot of influence trapped in his own ideology, unwilling to venture outside his own paradigm and imagine something different. To simply chalk socialism up to some utopian pipe dream and resign himself to the idea that capitalism is the best we can do is, well, he'd probably say pragmatic, but I'd say it's a crapshoot. There is no reforming capitalism. Now, don't get me wrong here. I want to make it very clear from the very beginning that I am very much in favor of policies which help vulnerable populations, which give people access to healthcare and which provide marginalized groups access to the things they need and which ultimately make regular everyday people's lives better. We absolutely need people on the front lines working to make this happen. We need people working on single issue campaigns, fighting for equal rights, and generally working within the system to create change. However, reform policies such as these made within this top-down hierarchical system where politicians are paid off by wealthy corporations to act in their favor, where it is always more profitable to cut corners, ignore environmental regulations, put a downward pressure on wages, and move jobs overseas, are often temporary and always subject to rollback by incoming administrations. Sure, reforms are good, 
But if reforming capitalism is the goal in and of itself, if you think individual policies or social safety nets can counter the fundamental flaws built into the system, I'd have to disagree. Capitalism is a system which contains within it the seeds of its own demise, and no concession or reform can fix that. So let's talk about why. Part 1. The Contradictions of Capital In David Harvey's book, 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism, he lays out, you guessed it, 17 contradictions lying at the heart of capitalism. I'm obviously not going to have a chance to discuss them all today, but I would like to talk about a couple in an attempt to highlight the ways in which capitalism at its core is volatile, contradictory, unstable, and always subject to implosion. As I briefly discussed before, capitalism arose out of a process called primitive accumulation, where peasants and various resident populations were violently expelled from their land forcing them into urban centers to work for a wage. The stolen land, the resources, tools, everything used for production was privatized and subsumed by the bourgeoisie and used to subjugate a landless proletariat, to extract from them their surplus labor and to accumulate capital. Similarly, craftsmen and artisans who were privately creating goods for exchange in the market couldn't compete with the socialized production being employed by capital. As manufacture developed and industrialization took hold and work became more and more specialized, productivity skyrocketed and independent artisans and craftsmen were forced out of business and coerced into selling their labor power for a fraction of its value, aka a wage thus joining the bulk of the peasants and other folks dispossessed of their land, their craft, and their means of subsistence. Thus, society was divided into two classes, those who own the means of production and who profit off the unpaid labor of others, the capitalists, and those who don't, the workers. And centuries of ideological indoctrination since have told us that this arrangement is consensual and beneficial for both parties involved. I mean, they're both getting paid, right? Unfortunately, the problem is that they are both getting paid for work that only one of them is doing. And if we look at the bigger picture in terms of class struggle, we start to see that virtually all of the wealth being created in this world is being created by a majority class of dispossessed workers who get to keep very little of it, while a minority elite class who creates none of the wealth is able to accumulate all of it. This is what Marxists refer to as worker exploitation and is the basis for class struggle. I should also add that Marx did break down these classes further, discerning between the petty bourgeoisie, for example, which comprised small business owners and shopkeepers, the lumpen proletariat, which were basically those that lacked class consciousness, etc. But for our purposes, and generally speaking, there are two main classes, those who do the exploiting and the exploited. And what ultimately drives this exploitation, besides an insatiable greed for more profit, is what Marx called the coercive laws of competition. This is why ultimately it doesn't matter if you're the nicest, most benevolent capitalist in the world. In order to keep up with competitors, there will inevitably come a time when you are forced to place a downward pressure on wages, cut corners, and just generally intensify exploitation in order to maximize profit and undercut competition. This is not incidental, but a function of the system. It is built into it. Furthermore, in order to increase productivity and cheapen their products, they will also invest in sophisticated machinery, which unfortunately also has the added side effect of making workers redundant. To quote Frederick Ingalls, the very product of the worker is turned into an instrument of his subjugation. Only under capitalism does it make sense that increased productivity brought about through technological innovation and automation, something that should be able to liberate workers by shortening their working day, could in fact increase instability, stagnate wages, and lead to permanent structural unemployment and ultimately crisis within the system. 
Now, in an attempt to fight back against this exploitation, workers will try to organize against the capitalist class. They will try to create unions, to stage protests and walkouts, and to demand better treatment. This creates a tension, a struggle between classes. This instinctive desire on the part of both capitalist and worker to push the rate of exploitation in opposite directions creates a constant tension in capitalist society. The class struggle, with all its social manifestations in conflicting ideas, organizations, institutions, the very existence of which is denied by right-wing ideologues. But the class struggle, with its ups, downs, swings, and roundabouts over time, in the last analysis, decisively influences all social and historical change. And ultimately, class consciousness gained by the working class through class struggle is what Marx identified as the source of total liberation from capitalism into a society where those that create the wealth enjoy the wealth. Unfortunately, what we've seen over the past 40 years is a systematic rolling back of workers' rights, a dismantling of collective labor power and unions, an outsourcing of jobs and stagnating wages. As a result, corporate profits have soared, in similar proportion, I might add, to the amount in which wages have sunk. And of course, this means inequality has skyrocketed. But besides that being unfair and unjust, why is this a problem? Well, in order to maintain a substantial rate of profit, corporations must continue to saturate the market with more and more of whatever they're selling. And unfortunately for them, the purchasers of these products are often the same people whose wages have been depressed, and thus they have no purchasing power to buy these products. Thus, we have a crisis of overproduction brought about by an oversaturated market and or a lack of effective demand. Now, here's the thing. Capitalism is extremely adaptive and will oftentimes find ways of subverting these crises, but only temporarily. See, instead of increasing wages and, I don't know, actually providing people with the resources and income to actually cover their needs, we instead started pumping credit into the system, artificially supplying consumers with enough capital to buy up all that stuff that had overaccumulated. But what happens when they have to pay this money back, you ask? Well, this is exactly the problem we ran into with the subprime mortgage crisis and subsequent financial crisis of 2007, 2008. I mean, it only makes sense that offering predatory loans to desperate and vulnerable people who won't be able to pay them back is a surefire way of ensuring absolute catastrophe. And that's exactly what happened. A fatal combination of stagnating wages mixed with increasing debt eventually led to a rippling effect of debt defaults, crippling the financial institutions along with millions of people's livelihoods. And ultimately, it wasn't the people whose lives were destroyed or the small businesses who were bailed out. It was the greedy bankers and corporate elites who managed to walk away unscathed, receiving hefty bonuses for their ineptitude. We saw small businesses go under, being absorbed by larger ones, and concentrating capital in fewer and fewer hands. This is the bedrock of capitalism and another inherent contradiction. As capitalists compete, market leaders will naturally appear and will buy out or drive out their rivals, taking more of a market share and increasing their size. Monopolies inevitably form, giving them the power to dictate prices, to influence legislation and government regulation. And in fact, we can look to just a few hundred corporations, banks, and other institutions which pretty much own everything and control the commerce of the world. And if you think that the state is somehow going to come in and rescue everything and reform all these issues away, if you think they're going to redistribute wealth and income more equitably or to side with labor over their corporate overlords, think again. The state is in cahoots with capital every step of the way. And when labor does manage to organize and fight back, or when a crisis of overproduction occurs and consumers don't have the purchasing power to buy any of the goods being sold, and so the state is forced to capitulate and enact reform policies, well, these policies are you know, subject to 
constant recall and usually end up getting revoked within a very, very short period of time. Take the New Deal, the most comprehensive and robust attempt to reform capitalism in history. And within a generation, most, if not all of the advances made, were stripped away. Rolled back by neoliberal private interests focused on privatization, deregulation, and austerity. Focused on stripping workers of their rights, their unions, and their social safety nets. It took less than six months in 1983 to reverse 40% of the decisions which were considered too favorable to labor. Why did this happen? Because as corporations accumulate more and more capital, as they gain more and more power, they find new and innovative ways to gain political control. They often band together to lobby against consumer protection legislation, workers' rights and antitrust laws and other regulations. They find loopholes in and seek to reform tax laws and form political action committees, essentially buying their way into political favor. Of the world's top 100 economic revenue collectors, 29 are states, 71 are corporations. Just let that sink in for a minute. And you can call this crony capitalism or a corporatocracy all you want, but when profit seeking is the motive, when cutthroat competition is the norm, then monopolies and revolving door politics are baked into the system. By the way, if you want a more in-depth look into the relationship between the state and corporate interests, I did a video discussing just that, which I will link above and below. Part two, perpetual growth. Okay, so the final point I want to discuss is the effects of a system reliant on perpetual growth. As we've discussed, capitalism depends on a continuous flow of capital, money in constant search of more money, or as David Harvey explains it, value in motion. And this need to accumulate capital means the system must continuously expand. This is why politicians and media pundits and economists relentlessly talk about growing our economies, growing GDP, because capitalism will collapse otherwise. The contradiction arises between a system which demands infinite growth, bumping up against the limitations of a finite planet, the effects of which are producing irreversible ecological devastation. Quite simply, we are extracting resources at an unsustainable rate, and along the way, we are dispossessing indigenous folks of their land and their way of sustaining themselves for quote-unquote development, overtaking their local markets, and destroying the very ecosystems which keep this planet turning. A system based on perpetual growth cannot function without peripheries and externalities. There must always be an extraction zone, from which materials are taken without full payment, and a disposal zone, where costs are dumped in the form of waste and pollution. As the scale of economic activity increases under capitalism affects everything, from the atmosphere to the deep ocean floor, the entire planet becomes a sacrifice zone. We all inhabit the periphery of the profit-making machine. And again, even if you have the most ecologically conscientious CEO or president of a company, they are always going to cut costs as much as possible and concentrate on short-term profits in order to remain competitive. And this means ignoring externalities and pushing these costs onto the whole of society, the costs of which have been staggering. Consider the devastation that ensued after BP recklessly cut corners and ignored regulations in order to maximize profit, resulting in the largest oil spill in history. Or we can look at the way Brazilian firms have ravaged the Amazon, deforesting and transforming the land into a source of agribusiness revenue, all of which links directly to the raging fires spreading through the area. These externalities are a result of a system that cares only for profit and which has little regard for the well-being of the planet or its people inhabiting it. I should also add that the profit motive also creates uneven resource distribution, leaving us in a situation where we have enough food to feed the world 1.5 times over, yet billions are starving and one third of the food produced gets lost or is thrown away. 
where empty homes outnumber the homeless six to one in the United States alone, meaning we have 3.5 million homeless people living side by side 18.5 million empty houses. Destiny has claimed that capitalism is the most efficient system for allocating resources effectively. But if this was the case, we should be able to meet every person on this planet's most basic needs. We are living in a time where more wealth has been created than ever before, and yet 26 people own more wealth than the bottom 50%. No one has the right to hoard billions of dollars while some people have zero dollars. That is an absolute injustice and a huge sign that the system is dysfunctional at its core. There's honestly a million more contradictions I could talk about. The financial system alone has been propped up since the 1970s and has created massive wealth inequality in and of itself, instability, and fictitious capital. I could talk about the fact that these crises, these boom and busts, um, and the crises that result are never really resolved, but rather pushed around geographically, starting in one area and just moving to another. Part three. So where do we go from here? Okay, so the last thing I'll say is this. Although I do believe some variant of socialism is the answer to capitalism's built-in contradictions, it's not actually necessary to produce a blueprint of capitalism's replacement in order to recognize that capitalism is failing. It doesn't make sense to me that me, one person, or any other individual person should be responsible for explaining the intricacies of whatever system comes next. Sure, we can and should brainstorm together, imagine together how hypothetical situations might play out and you know, try to figure out um, how the problems of today can be resolved in a better system tomorrow. We should absolutely discuss theory and debate why certain methods for transition may be better than others and, you know, debate the best ways of organizing society based on people's needs, you know, based on their geographic uh, location, their culture, etc. But ultimately, nobody has the power to predict what a future society might look like, right? And that's kind of the point. I mean, we don't want some authoritarian top-down structure where one person has all the power and decides what happens, right? Or where those with the most money get to dictate the way resources are allocated. That isn't working. We see that's not working. We need something different. And if we want to get there, we need a variety of tactics. We need to be building broad-based coalitions, working at the grassroots to build momentum and class solidarity. We need online activists and IRL activists, protests and demonstrations, dual power structures, electoral politics, and grassroots organizing. We need to use all of the tools at our disposal. We need to work to subvert the status quo to deprogram built-in capitalist ideology and Ultimately, in order to accomplish this, we need to work within the system as well as without. And finally, I'll end with this last bit about destiny. As Thought Slime recently said, destiny is trapped within the liberal hellscape, as so many are, unable to imagine a different way of life, a different way of organizing the world. But capitalism isn't a system based on human nature. It's not the end of history or at least it doesn't have to be. There is an alternative. What if we all work to figure out what that alternative is? All right, guys, so that's it. If you like this video, please give it a like, share, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that bell notification so you're alerted every time I post a new video. Also, if you'd like to help me out financially, you can join my Patreon at patreon.com slash madblender. I really appreciate all of you that have joined and that have stuck with me. I know it's been a while since I posted. My kids were out of school for the summer and I was trying to spend as much time as possible with them as I could, uh, but they're back in school now, so I hope to be a bit more consistent with my content. Uh, I had posted last video about doing a 5K Q&A, but somehow I managed to gain a bunch of subscribers and so I figured I'd just wait and do a 20K Q&A since I'm almost there. Uh, so I will be back soon with that. Again, I really want to thank all my 
patrons. Your support has been amazing. Uh, and I'd especially like to thank Aaron Siegfried, P.D. Morin, Catherine, Chrissy Ta, Hugh Laurie, Ricardo Petinga, Andy Haywood, Tom T, DG, Unkind Granola, Acorn Rosengard, Mr. Bassa, Gazitas, Shannon Carroll, Stephanie Gatormson, Marie Madrego, Lefty Techie, and a huge shout out to a son of a bitch and Peter Sterling for their very generous contributions. Thanks again, guys. Bye.